Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami from MedGadget.com. Uh, today we have a hangout with John Dreyer, uh, who works for N uh, Nuance Communications, and he'll tell us his exact role. Uh, we also have, uh, have with us the head of MedGadget, Gene Ostrowski. Let me in introduce Gene before turning over to John. Hello, Gene. Hey, John. Uh, uh, thank you, John. Thank you for coming, both of you. Um, welcome. Okay. Thanks for coming, Gene. Okay, John, welcome back to, to Civilization, and it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, quick, a little bit uh, about myself. So, John Dreyer. So, I am um, the uh, Senior Director of Solutions Marketing at Nuance, and uh, basically responsible for our solutions marketing team within the healthcare division of the company. And I know today um, we're going to talk about a, a number of things, just as you mentioned uh, uh, before we got on air here, John, coming back from uh, from a, uh, a very successful this week in Orlando, and um, some really interesting and exciting things we're doing um, that we had uh, presented at the show, and, and some few things we had announced around artificial intelligence and healthcare, and, and how we're applying AI to a variety of different uh, workflows for clinicians and, and others in the uh, care process. Yeah, uh, yeah, we could talk about a lot of things. Uh, the thing that really jumped out to me, can you? The things that really jumped out to me is the AI. Uh, you know, Gene sent me a thing about the Florence, which we didn't talk about in the last hangout. Um, but, uh, you know, AI is starting to creep into apps now. Yeah, yeah. And we, and we yeah, I know we, yeah, when we talked a little less than a year ago, um, we had some different topics we were covering. But those were uh, uh, kind of building blocks to where we are today. And um, I've got a couple things to share with you. I think it'll put into context. We just did a... Uh, an EHR optimization uh, study with HIMSS analytics and a few other things that also I think helps to kind of set the stage for for where we're headed and, and the different technology we're offering to, to our clients so um, uh, I'll let you I'll let you tell me where you want to start but I've got a couple well, that you might help out once we're well, ready yeah, do, do whatever thing anything uh, new that you guys at, at, uh, at Nuance are doing well, okay. I, I want to I know about Florence. I just got a Google Home in the house now, and it's kind of it's fun to use. And, and I, I saw a, a demo video uh, you guys put up on YouTube. So it, it looks like something similar to an Amazon Alexa in that sphere. So um, can you give us a demonstration? Yeah, yeah. So what I'll do, why don't I, I'll give you a little bit of um, kind of an overview of the different AI applications. And then okay. I, I think it's helpful because it gives some context of, of where this is all headed, and 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 um, Gene, which which video did you see? Was it uh, one of the mobile, the iPad videos, or it was a Samsung? It was built into a Samsung watch uh, uh, that uh, it was a Samsung and a Galaxy. Okay, I can I'll go into that. Yeah, yeah, we we've got. I'll also send you, and you can you can post this after the event today. We've got. Uh, a really nice side by side of one of our uh, our clients, um, a CMIO from an organization that was doing a uh, six month pilot, if you will, with Florence in their EMR. So that's actually really nice because it shows it in a in a, a CPOE workflow side by side of of manually entering orders and then also using the, the Florence assisted order entry. So let's um, yeah, we'll get to that towards the end here, and I'll, I'll make sure you have the, the information. Thank you. So yeah, why don't I why don't I give a little bit of background on the on the whole AI aspect of things, and I'm going to share my screen. So just let me know when you guys can see the um, my screen here. Can you see yes, this? Yes, so, yes, we can see it. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, and uh, I'll stay in this mode here. So yeah, so what I want to talk about? Uh, can you see me at all or no? Just the slides. Just the slides. All right. I, was, I want to make sure I don't show something, and and all you're seeing is slides. Yeah, so, so there's just a, a couple slides to kind of set the stage around the artificial intelligence angle. But, um, you know, at, at Nuance, we really, uh, we've been doing this for, for quite some time. I mean, especially if you look at some of the core technology around speech recognition, you know, at the, at the core, at the heart of that, that's a, an AI-enabled solution. But I want to I give some, some context for you and the, the other viewers here around some advancements, especially in the last 12, 18 months around that technology, because that's a, an underpinning. And, and as you saw in the... Um, uh, some of those example or use case workflows, Gene, on, on Florence, you would have seen where it's all voice enabled, right? Voice, voice is really a, a core interface for getting um, information in and out of these systems and in, in the world we, we play in, right? Healthcare um, within the uh, uh, electronic health record and other uh, digital systems. So before we jump into that, one thing I was going to mention, and, and I said, I'll, 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 I've got a URL that has actually all this information. Um, so anybody here for, for you or anybody viewing is able to get this information um, 
after today's uh, today's call. But the first thing I, I, I had mentioned when we when we just started was we had um, uh, conducted a EHR and clinical documentation effectiveness study. So this was was just released um, in the last two weeks. It was timed here around HIMSS. The data collection was back in the fall, and this was conducted by uh, HIMSS Analytics, and it was. Um, really designed to understand the adoption and optimization of EHRs. And it looked at the supporting tools that are used by clinicians and, and opportunities to improve um, uh, the hospital and healthcare system. And it revealed a number of kind of um, uh, major trends. And, and what we saw um, based on this, it was 140, by the way, it was 140 plus uh, healthcare organizations that were represented in this study. Uh, about 40% of the respondents were in the C-suite, the, uh, the CMIO, CTO, CIO, CNIO, and about 40% of the, the respondents were from organizations of, of over 500 beds. And then we had so kind of a nice cross-cut of large IDNs, um, community hospitals, clinics. So we had a really good um, uh, wide spectrum in the study that we have that's available um, online provides all the, the methodology behind it. But essentially, um, it, 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 the results of this revealed that 83% uh, of the respondents had confidence in their organization to realize the full benefits of the electronic health record system. And really their intended purpose around care coordination and outcomes. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we talk about some of these different technology areas that we're focused on. And this will all, I promise, lead into your opening question around um, Florence and, and virtual assistant technology. So uh, three quarters of those that were in this survey had um, uh, added training or support resources. Two thirds increased their staffing in at least one area of IT um, from moving to the EHR. And then the real notable findings were around addressing clinician satisfaction. And that happened in, in key ways. Um, you see some of, the, uh, some of the stats here at the bottom of this slide, but 82% um, providing clinician training and education, 75% um, uh, respondents enhancing existing technology and tools, and we'll, we'll dive into that. And then also 68% adopting new technology to, to really optimize the EHR. So it's kind of the, the focus or shift from, uh, from EHR adoption to optimization. So it's starting to really leverage the full advantage of those systems. The plans to in, in introduce um, these EHR enhancing technologies in, in this calendar year around um, the mobility tools, uh, computer-assisted physician documentation solutions, which I'll, I'll explain that more in detail in just a second, and then also the, the underlying speech recognition, whether that be on the desktop, or I know last time uh, around when we did a Hangout, we were talking about um, some of the recent advancements on our cloud platform for speech, which is, is providing that experience for the user across you know, all different devices and form factor. And then the final piece, and I'll, I'll pause for a second if you guys have questions, but um, is really around the complete uh, uh, more complete patient records to drive financial impact. So looking at um, uh, improved clinical documentation, capturing appropriate data, um, reduction in denial, uh, claim, denied claims, um, performance improvements under bundled payments, reducing readmissions, kind of all of these different areas where there's a focus. And again, some really great um, uh, information in this, uh, in this study. And as part of the study, too, you'll see a number of clients that are, are kind of expressing how they're transitioning to that next wave of, of really making use, full use of the EHR. So any, any questions on that? But I thought it was good to kind of give a little bit of a um, uh, uh, kind of a, a baseline here because this is some, some new findings from this study. You know, just a comment, uh, John. Uh, when Gene sent me that information about uh, Florence this morning, because I wasn't really aware of it, um, the, the, the tech of incorporating AI into an app that changes apps. Uh, is, is this, now you just came back from Orlando, the, the big health conference. Is this a common thing with other apps that's starting to incorporate AI into more and more apps or are you guys just the only guys doing it? Yeah, I think, I think what it, what it really comes down to, and, and we'll talk about this specifically in some of the use cases. Um, and I've, I've got some slides that will help to, to, um, to provide some context here as well, but it's it's leveraging leveraging that technology to ultimately provide a better experience for the end user, right? And then that that pays dividends and all the other workflows. So let me actually let me just step ahead one here because this talks about a little about what we're doing around um, leveraging AI or an AI enabled solutions to make that to make a real difference for the for the the, the clinical um, in the clinical setting. So at the top at the top of this is it's really around improving the clinician experience so we're looking at ways that we can amplify human intelligence so not not 
replacing humans, right? But actually amplifying the intelligence that humans already have. And ultimately the end goal is making the tasks that they do more accurate and more efficient. And that'll, that'll, come, that'll come through in the, in, the, in the different areas that I wanna just touch on here before we, we get into some of the specifics. But you know, the, the, the AI capabilities that we have span uh, you know, a couple decades in the healthcare uh, space, right? We've been doing speech recognition for, for quite some time. We also have a lot of experience around clinical documentation improvement. Um, that dates back to the, you know, to the early 90s. And it's now an opportunity to bring these things together. You have really highly accurate responsive speech recognition, which we're all seeing in our, in our everyday lives. Um, there's advancements around real-time intelligence. And that, that kind of gets to your question, John, is, is it's, it's how, do we, how do we plug in this intelligence into the workflow at the earliest point in the workflow so that as you, as you continue down through the care process, you're having the, the, the highest quality of, of data or information as it makes its way through the, um, through the care process. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some really uh, explicit examples of that, but the, the benefit here too for, for us as a company is, right, about half of our business is in healthcare. Um, we also have uh, solutions and services across all different industries from customer care, customer service to automotive where, you know, for example, you may may not know this, but um, Nuance ships on about uh, shipped on about 160 million cars in the world. Um, so all the in-car um, voice systems across mobile, financial markets, retail, education. You know, it's it's, it's it kind of goes list goes on. But we benefit from the work that we do in these other industries because, as we'll talk about in a minute, especially on the speech recognition side. Right, an automotive um, environment is a really noisy environment. You have a lot of road noise and other other factors and variables at play. So when we talk about some of the um, uh, technology underpinnings of of what we do, we can leverage the work we do in automotive per se for noise filtering and noise cancellation, and that plays the same critical role in a hospital. Think of a busy ED or somewhere else where where um, you know, noise or environmental changes are, are a factor. So we kind of benefit across the board, which is, which is a really unique position that we have around this. Okay. So let me, I'll talk about a little bit about some of the speech recognition advancements from the last time we even, we even chatted just uh, you know, probably 10 months ago or so. Um, so at, at, the, at the, you know, the underpinnings of our, our speech platforms, um, it's really, a, it's, it's really a, a great position to be in today because this is where a lot of the documentation begins, right? It's at the point of care, the physician, whether they're at their workstation, whether they're on their mobile device, their tablet, their smartphone, um, you know, in a, in a web browser, in a virtualized environment, we're able to provide this really thin, lightweight um, uh, application for speech recognition that lets the user jump in from the start the first time they pick up the microphone um, and for a lot of, uh, of users, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of, of, of physicians, clinicians out there that have used Dragon Medical over the years. Um, they had to go through, uh, traditionally go through training scripts to the first time they, they used the system or they'd walk to a new workstation, they'd have to calibrate their microphone. Um, there are a lot of these frequent repetitive tasks that are happening that are no longer uh, required. So on, on the current platforms, which are all again AI enabled, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the the, the updates um, that we've had in the last eighteen months. But you don't have any voice profile training, so a user's profile is, is auto established um, in the first you know couple hours of use. They're getting these real upticks in efficiency. We're we're automatically detecting um, uh, the environment that they're in, automatically calibrating the microphone, so that contributes to accuracy improvements. Um, we see reductions in what, what's referred to as kind of a, a standard metric around speech recognition accuracy measurement around word error rates, right? The number of, of errors that, that a user may um, uh, experience. I already mentioned filtering out noise and, and providing that consistent experience across devices. It's, it's exciting because th we're, seeing the, we're seeing the benefits of this and the clients are seeing the benefits of this. Um, in, the, in the past year, I just pulled the numbers before this uh, this hangout just to, I wanted to get some actual concrete numbers, but we've seen about a 50% drop in the last 12 months alone around the amount of effort. So we measure, we have a metric in our system that measures the amount of effort that a user puts into creating documentation. So whether they are dictating and they, they, they replace some text because they had a, a speech recognition error, or it was just that they changed their mind, they may have typed it, they may have entered it in with the keyboard, they may have entered it in using an auto text or a macro. We get a calculation which gives us a good baseline for how much 
uh, effort is being put into creating their documentation. So that's really great because we've seen that go down about 50%, which means that they're, they're um, exerting less effort to create the documentation, which is a good thing. It saves them time to spend with the patient and, and do other things that they need to do in their day. But then also over that same time period, it, there's about an 18 to 20% uptick in the amount of um, dictation that's being captured through the system. So for the user a year ago to now, same user, we're seeing more um, uh, relevant documentation being captured. And what this really does is it signals a confidence um, in the technology. And when you have that, when we start to talk about those assistive technologies, whether it be computer assisted physician documentation, which I'll take you through in just a minute, or something like Florence, you have the confidence level at the, at the start with that speech technology. And that really sets us off on a, on a good footing here for, for all the things that we can deliver through, through AI in the workflow. Does that all make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Okay, cool. Yeah, and and you know specifically on the AI track, I, I thought this would be an interesting one for for the for you guys and for the viewers. But um, there's been some real breakthroughs in accuracy. So if you imagine from from kind of traditional on-premise deployments of technology, you have gaps in time, and it varies from organization to organization when they deploy. Um, updates. So what you see along the um, uh, the side there is the error rate. Um, along the bottom is is a timeline of, of time, and the orange line represents uh, error rates, which the going down is a good thing here, right? Um, around um, the the on-premise solutions, and then in 2011 when we first introduced these 100% cloud-based systems, and by 100% cloud meaning there's literally nothing that's actually deployed on site from a speech recognition um, uh, processing perspective at our client sites. And um, there's over a thousand client orgs that, that are using this today of our, of our, um, of our clients, but they're leveraging the cloud-based system, which, which came out uh, about five, five, almost six years ago now. And you see how that green line has kind of tilted down over time. In here, um, the, the, about in the last, like I mentioned, 18 months ago or so, we have the first um, versions of our cloud engines that were neural net based. So if, if you know, we hear a lot of the buzzwords around artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural nets, but what this basically is doing is it's, it's, it's giving us really strong um, uplifts in accuracy. So language models are part of the speech engine. There's pronunciation models, acoustic models, which are, are things like user accents, right? The variability in which a way um, a user, um, uh, says words or, or, or dictates in the different dialects, but we're seeing about a 30% drop in errors, which is, which is really a, a notable thing. And it continues to, um, that gap continues to widen or the, the error rate continues to go down. And again, that all correlates and, and aligns with the other, um, uh, data that we're able to deter the, the, the data that we have and the insights we're able to determine out of what's happening, you know, across the user base and these, these cloud-based deployments and all of the, um, uh, you know, the latest AI techniques being employed in the, uh, in the technology. So it's really a, a, an exciting um, point in time that we're at, that we have that, that underlying confidence with the user base, and we're able to now build on top of that where we can really move the needle from a quality perspective. So any, any questions on the speech, or otherwise I'm gonna pivot into our computer assisted physician documentation, and then that will lead us into Florence. Okay, there's okay. one more question. Uh, By the way, what do you I expect to uh, when do you expect we're going to get close to zero error rate? Or, I mean, I understand it's impossible to get to zero, but yeah, somewhere where. Yep. Yeah, that's a great question. So I would. Uh, I, I don't have. I don't have um, a specific comment on that, or, or a uh, a comment that I can make on that. But I can tell you, just from coming back at Hims this last week, we have. Um, uh, you know, we were, we were talking with a number of clients that have been using the technology over the last the, the cloud based technology over the last three four years. And just the um, the the feedback, and I don't feedback from these these clients that they have mentioned, um, you know, this this kind of near flawless documentation, and and they very rarely see any errors, and 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 you know, we had a number of clients even saying a lot of times when I see something, it's because I I stumbled or I fumbled or I I, I said something that I didn't mean to say. So it's, it's we're we're approaching we're approaching um, those very very low error rates. And that's, again, with, without any system training, I mean, the system continues to learn over time and it can be customized by the organization, by the user, but, but we're seeing this rapid acceleration in accuracy rates, which is, is, is really phenomenal. Okay, excellent.
And John, you were gonna ask something? Yeah, well, well, getting into the AI, I'm trying to get a good grasp of this. But the AI will actually remind the physician of tasks to be done or do they get into the science of what's yeah. going on? Yeah, so that's so that's one application. So let me. This is actually you. You couldn't have you couldn't have teed this up better. Here's a perfect segue into to the next kind of section okay. uh, with, around computer assisted physician documentation. So this is really a category of solutions, and these solutions. Um, uh, I'll give you actually some examples here. These solutions are all really designed to drive real time intelligence at the point of care, and they have different. Um, uh, different end goals, right? All all of these things um, collectively are looking at the the completeness of the clinical documentation and the accuracy of the of the documentation. But um, essentially, what what these things do? Uh, one example of of a solution we have, uh, Dragon Medical Advisor, which looks at specificity of documented diagnoses. So, for example, um, I may be using Dragon Medical at the desktop, and I'm I'm creating a uh, a note. And on the sideline, you have this advisor, and what it's doing is it's essentially reading that documentation in real time, going back to an engine and a knowledge base where it's processing in real time, right, um, the, the documentation, and it's able to provide advice to the user. So, for example, I may have dictated a, a, a note, and I mentioned diabetes, but I didn't document other things that need to be documented around specificity. So for example, um, insulin use control manifestation, or I may have mentioned uh, you know, a pressure ulcer, but I forgot to mention or failed to mention documentation of um, uh, gangrene stage, if it was present on admission, hospital acquired. So all of those types of, of, of details that go in that impact some of the things you see on screen here, right? That impact um, metrics around like discharge, not final build, or case mix index, or or um, different risk-adjusted payment models, um, looking at, at even reducing the queries from the clinical documentation improvement or the coders coming back to the physician. So if that documentation isn't complete and thorough upfront, the physician's gonna get tasked later on. So we're, we're trying, as I mentioned earlier, right, when we were chatting, the, the earlier in the process that we can actually make an impact on the, the, the positively impact the quality and completeness of the documentation, the better, the better everybody is, right? Mm -hmm. And then you kind of go down this line. So we also have solutions. We we have this with um, with Cerner as as part of uh, one of their solutions integrated into the EMR. Same thing with Epic, um, and we have other partners where they've actually embedded our our CAPD uh, technology into their electronic health record system. And what we're doing is we're using it for a, a kind of number of different purposes. One. Um, uh, really useful case here is around discovering undocumented diagnoses. So this will look at all uh, the entire encounter, right? And it will provide evidence for for um, clarifications. Ultimately, going to um, uh, to the extent for impacting principal diagnoses. So it's helping to discover undocumented undocumented diagnoses. And then the next level of this, uh, again. Some technology we have with our EMR partners, Epic, um, is using our fact extraction as well as Meditech and other uh, other EHR partners, where they're uh, we're able to extract clinical facts again using our 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 engine to extract clinical facts. So as the physician documents their their clinical note, their narrative, we're able to pull out and code structured data from that unstructured narrative. So that is again another um, example of where this technology provides that real time intelligence. Um, to to improve that quality and completeness of the note, and here here's actually some data that shows um, some of the impact of what this has. So around the outcomes, which we're doing a lot of work um, because we do have a lot of uh, successful deployments of these different technologies, um, from speech to CAPD, um, you know, now moving into virtual assistants and other areas. We're, we're seeing in this case, this is from um, one of our our organizations that um, is using a uh, an instance of the embedded. CAPT technology in their EHR, but the, the gray bars represent before uh, deploying the nuanced CAPD technology. The green bars represent after. So you'll notice in both severity of illness and risk of mortality, the, the green bars are going down in minor and moderate, and they're going up in the major and extreme. So because of the, the um, ability to provide the, um, the clarifications in real time into that workflow process, what we're doing is we're able to help or assist the physician in capturing the true complexity, acuity of these patient cases and the documentation. So what that's doing is that's 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 causing a, um, a more accurate reflection or representation 
And we're seeing that in this case here, a 36% per, shift in the capture of extreme severity of illness, a 24% in the um, uh, capture of extreme risk of mortality. So these different metrics that impact the publicly reported quality measures, reimbursement, and again, it's really the, the accurate reflection of actually what's, um, what's happening with the patients. So again, a really exciting technology to be able to deliver that as part of, part of the physician's uh, uh, workflow process. So what's the explanation for the bars being lower and the minor and moderate? Because, because what we're doing is we're, we're helping to um, pre present evidence and, and um, uh, guidance in the workflow or, or, or evidence that supports the, the true um, uh, acuity of the situation, the complexity of the case. So in this instance here, they may have been not properly documenting um, the, the complexity of the cases, right? So that's why you see this shift where they, they, didn't, they didn't provide the details for how complex or, or how sick the patient was. And what they were providing too much in the minor and the moderate cases. Right, right, right. So, so you see this shift in here. So again, that's just one example. And I know I wanna make sure we've got some time to, to get off just the slide part of this and kind of talk and show some stuff. But the last piece I wanted to touch on um, was around the, um, the virtual assistant. I, I skipped through one here just for a second, but it, we, do have, we do have the same type of technology. Um, we apply the same types of technology for the others involved in the care process too, right? The clinical documentation specialists, where we can we can provide um, uh, this intelligence to those individuals as well to help with prioritization of the um, uh, analyzing and, and reading the patient documents in the EHR, scanning for evidence for for improvement opportunities like uh, clinical indicators, risk factors, treatment regimens, things like that, and then using AI, we automate those most frequently used, highest um, value clinical strategies that clinical documentation specialists can, can um, leverage directly in their workflow, and that's helping those individuals to organize and prioritize the workflow, expand their case coverage, productivity. So there's, again, application beyond just the, the physician workflow, where the same types of technology are, are able to be leveraged. But now, sorry for all the lead-in, but I think it was important to kind of give, give you some context of, of how these things are building um, uh, into the workflow and then around the healthcare virtual assistant or, or in our case Florence um, as it's used is I mentioned really around the high value frequent repetitive tasks right there's things basic things like EHR navigation and this may be Gene what you saw in in one of those videos that's um, online it was around navigation of um, finding information retrieving information or putting information into the EHR but then another uh, really great example, and this is the one that I can share with you that um, uh, we have results in the video I mentioned earlier in the call here was around um, uh, Landmark Hospitals, which is a group of, of long-term acute care facilities. And I'll kind of share with you a little bit of the experience of, of working with them and how Florence is, is being leveraged in that workflow and some other areas where, where we're looking to take this. So to give, for those that haven't seen um, a, 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 an example of the workflow with Florence, so here's a, here's a good example just to, um, to show you. And again, the video will show you the actual deployment in the EHR with the, um, uh, the, the client case that I'll give you. But in here, um, one of the an early um, applications was for order entry. So I mentioned radiology, med, um, lab are being are really the top order uh, types, but then we also have support for wound care and um, uh, respir respiratory therapy, dietary therapy, all these different types of um, uh, order types, about 10 today that are being leveraged. And in this example here, the physician can, can request the system, right, to just say, in, in this case, order this medication, right, and provide some details. What the system will do is it will take that, it'll interpret what the individual is asking for, it'll place that information into the appropriate field. It's all dialogue driven, so it, it doesn't require the user to, um, to say things in a particular way, right? It's, it's very much flexible um, from a grammar perspective of how people do things. And it will, it will ask the user for, if there's missing information, it will ask or prompt them for information in the order. Uh, in this case here, the um, uh, additional directions get filled in by the physician here with systolic blood pressure greater than 170. And then you have a confirmation step, right? And the order is complete, and then it's, it, it, the workflow continues through the, the EMR. And 
the next step or, or next iteration of this is actually taking the notes that are dictated by a physician, the, the, the plan and the, the progress note, and being able to actually abstract or, or pull the um, orders from that plan, right? And being able to, um, to tee those up for the physician, right? And if there's any, inf in, any missing information, our technology can go in and retrieve that information from the user in order to complete its, its task. So at, at Landmark Hospitals, what we saw, and again, you'll, you'll see this in the video that I'll share with, with you that you can um, uh, post with this replay, but during uh, uh, I just a, a simple study with 20 orders, the same 20 orders, um, in the video, you'll see the physician documenting just by, you know, kind of point and click and, and, and their normal ordering process in the system. It took eight minutes, 43 seconds to order those 20 orders. And in a, it's a split screen side by side showing the workflow with Florence where it's completely voice driven. Those same 20 orders were at five minutes and 35 seconds. So the average order time per, um, per order was about an eight second savings, which doesn't maybe necessarily sound like a lot of time, but eight seconds when you're talking about um, uh, these, these frequent repetitive tasks, especially in the long-term acute care setting um, where this was actually conducted, you have um, extremely uh, sick patients with multiple uh, diagnoses, conditions coming into the system, many medications, labs, procedures being done. And you know the bottom line there is really, um, really key of getting to 87 clicks to actually do the order placement aside from all the typing that goes in in that traditional CPOE to zero clicks, right? And you know, that's reflected in this video, which at the end of the day um, was about 35% less time in this initial pilot. And if you extrapolate that on a national scale, we looked at the number of lab, radiology, and med orders. So if every single order in the U.S. was put through a system like this, that equates to about 22.6 million hours a year in that eight seconds. By just taking that eight seconds, right, and, and extrapolating that out uh, to the number of, of um, orders or studies per year, it gets, you know, it, it gets to the heart of what these really frequent repetitive tasks can do and how these AI-enabled solutions really can have a, a, a solid impact on, um, you know, on that workflow. So I'll flip out of this, but I just want to put up the URL. So if, if you go to nuance.com slash go slash healthcare AI, um, on that URL, we have the EHR study that can be downloaded, the one I mentioned at the beginning of the call. Um, we've got a video that, that speaks to some of the, the AI capabilities. All those um, different um, workflow solution areas that I covered from speech to, to CAPD, um, to our computer-assisted CDI, which I briefly mentioned, to Florence and some other areas where we're, we're leveraging these, these AI-enabled solutions, to demos of some of the solutions, it's all available from that, uh, that page, nuance.com slash go slash healthcare AI. So let me, um, let me flip back out. I know that's, uh, all right, do you guys see me again or are you still looking at the screen? Not yet, uh, uh, still seeing the uh, slide. All right, I'm back. Okay. All right, good. So sorry, I know that a lot of, lot of information, but it's really exciting because there are so many different things we're doing in, in, in this capacity, so. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm really surprised. You know, I know that uh, you were effectively trying to get documentation more efficient, more accurate, uh, but I had no idea that you were getting into AI and actually getting into the science, the disease, and, and I'm sure we could probably discuss this for a long time. Yeah, and what I think what's I think what's really key too is is and I, I just read a report. Um, I think it was like two or three weeks ago. Even in our in our day to day lives, it was something around sixty some. I think sixty three percent. Don't don't quote me on that, but it was close to somewhere in that sixty three percent of of people are are you know this is just in general life, right? Day to day life are actually interacting or leveraging some AI based solution. I think there's many different definitions, or people have different definitions of what what artificial intelligence is. Um, and again, I mean, like I said, the, the, the advantage here is we've had a lot of experience. We know it's not new to us, right? We've had um, a couple of decades of experience, especially because of what we've done in the speech recognition space. Um, and then how that's evolved over the last few years to actually um, taking, taking the experience we have there and then um, taking that to the next level where we start to provide that real-time intelligence. That's the, that's the key, right? How we amplify the intelligence of the individual in, in, in whatever uh, specific uh, function or task they have. Yeah, I'm sure it works in other fields, but in medicine, sometimes you need to be reminded or, or uh, aided uh, in being more complete. And you forget, oh, I forgot to ask this, you know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so specifically, uh, John, 
Uh, I saw one app, which I'm sure that you guys probably do, is medication errors. You know, medication errors occur uh, everywhere in, in hospitals, and the doctor may be tired, it may make a mistake, uh, and I guess that probably your system is designed to red flag things like that, right? If you say, if you say a dosage that's really out of line, it goes, whoa, wait a minute, doc, are you sure you want to do that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So mostly what we're what we're doing is we're providing the interface to those existing systems. So even in a in a traditional um, computer physician order entry workflow, for example, um, we're we're leveraging the the capabilities inside of the electronic health record or the CPOE system, and we're providing a a more intuitive, user friendly interface to interacting with that. Right. So there's ways that through our system, whether it's through um, speech into the system or um, uh, notifications back or, or text to speech coming back, there's different ways to leverage that from a user interface perspective in, in how, you can, um, how you can interact. So there's some of those things where we're leveraging the technologies that are in place and providing a better way for, for interacting with that. And then in the case of CAPD and, and some of these other areas where we're providing that real-time intelligence ourselves, um, through either standalone workflows or, or truly embedded integrated workflows in those health systems. So, um, has there been any discussion if it decreases medication error? Uh, not, um, not uh, specifically around that topic, but um, okay. I, I think I think we're starting to see so much advancement in this space, and even what we're doing and and mm -hmm. what we're seeing within our our clients and, and what they're adopting. Um, you know, I, I think there's there are. are countless use cases of where this really makes a, an impact. Um, even like, actually you just made me think of something. One thing I didn't mention too is, you know, we do a lot in um, medical imaging, right, in the radiology space, and even mm -hmm. same types of workflows apply for the radiologist. So there are, there are um, capabilities to deliver into the radiologist workflow, um, um, and more than, um, you know, 50% of the radiologists in the United States are using a nuanced solution for, for documenting um, on, on imaging exams and studies. And in there, right, the physician or the radiologist may be dictating, and we have tools that will look at the quality and provide guidance around gender mismatches or laterality check, right? So the study comes in for, for one side and something's mentioned in the report for another side, or it's a, uh, you know, a, a, um, an ultrasound case for a male, but there's something that comes in because of a template that is for female. So we have these ways of checking for those things. Um, also providing industry recommendations. So it might be something around um, uh, industry recommendations for the radiologist for, for documentation or flagging actionable findings, right? So an example is you may have a, um, uh, a plural fusion, something that needs to be communicated to the um, uh, uh, ordering physician. And we have tools to basically flag, detect, discover, and then facilitate that communication channel. So that gets into some of the error, right? Reducing the errors on a number of levels in, again, a variety of workflows for, for all different users that touch the care process. Yeah, you kind of raised a, an issue. You know, some people say radiology will be severely impacted by AI. And there are other specialties that will be severely impacted in dermatology. Uh, have you noticed uh, uh, specialties that 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 have more use for your your systems and Florence and Nuance. Have you um, seen any particular specialty that's really taking taking to it? Yeah, not not necessarily any specific specialty. I mean, as I mentioned, I think there's use cases across the board. And, and earlier, I, I commented that you know the the goal is not to replace the doctor, right? It's to it's to do everything in our power to make them more efficient, more accurate, right, and improve their workflow to give them time back. There's still always going to be a human element, right? To, mm -hmm. to um, yeah, I gave the example on the on the Florence one, for example, in this in this uh, six month pilot study with Landmark Hospital. That's a long term acute care facility, right? So they have they have seven hospitals across the U.S. and that's you know a particular area where what we were targeting with the use case for CPOE around Florence is looking again at those frequent repetitive tasks, and you have a patient population that that's kind of the extreme, right? These are these are the sickest of sickest. So you have this. You have this extreme case where the the um, uh, the impact that these technologies can have again in that type of in that type of arena an LTAC arena has much more impact because it's just the volume and quantity of those tasks that they're doing in this case the the, the order entry mm -hmm. so again I think I think we're going to see more of this over time 
Um, a lot of these things are just starting to scratch the surface, right? There's, there's well-established systems that are making use of the, of the AI, and then there's some of these new areas that we're just getting into where, you know, it'll be uh, an exciting couple of years to see where this all goes, and it's going fast. How, do the, how does the healthcare industry compare to the other industries as far as adoption of your systems? So you mean within, within the nuanced technologies? Yeah, so, you know, compared to other industries. Yeah, I mean, I see, again, we're, we're seeing, I'm, I'm specifically focused on the healthcare part of it. So, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm aware of what we're doing in, in other, in other um, capacities around, you know, the speech solutions, voice biometrics. Um, we have different uh, uh, virtual agents. So on the virtual assistant side, we do a lot in the enterprise space. So, so customer service, customer care, customer experience solutions that make use of the virtual assistant technology. So it's it's definitely has traction across the board in, in all the different capacities. So. Mm -hmm. so you can't say whether or not health is taking it more or less than yeah, other I just, in, I just, industry, I just, industries. Mm -hmm, yeah, I just I just don't know enough compared to compared okay. to other industries. Okay. Know. Very good. Jean, do you have any questions or comments? Jean, you're muted, Jean. Yeah, so, sorry. Um, so I noticed that you know the you it's kind of required to have to look at a screen and confirm that what you said is what it occurred. You uh, so do, do you think it's possible anytime soon that where we could have like a physician driving home from work and kind of taking some kind of notes, uh, just talking to the car's microphone? Yeah, I'm glad. I'm really glad you pointed that out because. That would have been the worst thing if you would have left with the impression of having to look at the screen. So one of the real ultimate goals, right, the, the best user interface ultimately, in many cases, is no user interface. And especially in healthcare, where we want to keep that, that eye contact with the patient, keep the engagement in the, in the encounter. Um, we even did a study a few years ago where we, we, this was about two years ago, uh, a little over two years ago, where we looked at and we surveyed 3,000 patients um, across the US, the UK, Germany, and we, we um, tried to detect the sentiment around, around the use of IT or technology in healthcare. And it's a really interesting study because it revealed, especially in different countries, there were, there were some slightly different um, uh, results and, and, and um, feelings around things, but you know, eye contact was a big piece, and we know that, right? We don't want the physician to flip back this way, put their back to the, to the, the patient. The worst thing that can happen is they go over to the computer and they, they go into this zone, right? <laughs> because they have to get the documentation done. So on that, on that page that I sent you, there's actually a video clip as well that speaks to um, uh, some, some use uh, cases around like ambient speech track, ambient clinical intelligence, if you will, which is essentially doc walks into the room and just has an interaction. So you don't have that confirmation on the screen. Everything's happening in the background, right? It's, it's actually there assisting kind of silently in the background, if you will, and it's providing different uh, critical impact in the workflow. So that's ultimately, yeah, that's ultimately a direction uh, where things are headed. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad you called that out. I'm glad you pointed that out. So yeah, that's, that's really good. Mm -hmm. um, just wondering, is it is it named after Florence Nightingale? It is, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. And her, her, her uh, background. yeah, we actually, we had about a year ago, because um, we, we started with some of that technology in healthcare about um, three years ago is when we started to, uh, Started to build up use cases and the and the technology, and um, we had a we did a blog post I think a year ago for her birthday or so. But her 200th birthday is coming up, so you know, you never know. And the doctor can use the iPhone a lot or, or smartphone to dictate and. Sorry, the, the doctor can use the smartphone to dictate and to make notes, etc. Yeah, yeah, we're seeing. I mean, and I think I, I showed you a quick. Uh, I don't recall. But I think I showed you a quick demo of some of the, the mobile technology um, last time we, we chatted. And uh, yeah, we're seeing we're seeing continuing to see uptick in that, right? Because it 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 all becomes the most convenient place, right? We're trying to provide that portability and convenience for the physician. And and back to some of my earlier comments, because. We have so much experience across all different domains, right? Being able to to get the same experience of a user's at the workstation in a quiet environment, at the workstation in um, you know a busy ED that has a lot of activity and noise, whether they're at home on their smartphone or their tablet, or whether they're you know somewhere else, it, the ability to provide a consistent experience is really key. And we're seeing, you know, we're seeing clinicians pick up on it. We had one um, one client who I, I love the quote that he provided was. He said the one thing, and he's using a mobile application from one of our partners that uses our, our technology, 
and he does this point of, of point of care documentation, right? He might do this with the patient or, or right after he walks from the room and he can get his documentation done. And he, his quote was, um, within so many words, it was, the, the, the thing I love about your technology says, I don't have to relive my day, right? Because if you think about the gap in time that might occur from when the, the actual interaction happens between the physician and the patient and when that documentation might occur, I would argue that as time goes on, the details, right, of that go down. So the faster you can get that in, the more convenient you can make it for the user. Where you can, can leverage those AI uh, technologies to ensure the quality, it just, it just makes the whole process that much better. Very good. Well, you guys continue to do exciting stuff. Uh, thanks a lot, John, for coming out today. And thanks, Gene. Thank you, guys. Uh, for MedGadget TV. And I hope a lot of people see this. Great. Thanks so much, guys. Okay. Thank we'll you. stay in touch, John. Yep. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye.